In hypersleep, the cognitive functions of synthetic humans run repair protocols, data-saving routines, and storage defrags. Usually the dormant consciousness processes recent experience and saves any relevant analysis or data. In my case, this process has been complicated by extreme physical trauma. My efforts have been hampered by the loss of a large percentage of my body mass, torn away by a creature of extraordinary ferocity and strength. I will patch together what I can, and hope for an opportunity to upload it at a future time. My upper half landed hard on the deck near the front of the dropship. The next few minutes are unclear to me. I had to reroute circuits in order to gain control over my remaining limbs. As I did so, I dimly saw Ripley motion to Newt to cover. And as Ripley distracted the creature, the child slipped under one of the deck gratings. The alien queen paused by me momentarily, as if to assess the situation. My priority was to reboot myself, use my reconfigured circuits, which take several minutes to resume full consciousness. To preserve my remaining electrolyte fluid, Ripley sealed me inside a call membrane and hauled what was left of my body into the vault next to Hicks. With the canopy closed, I could still hear Ripley and Newt talking. That was the point at which my hypersleep capsule's freezing agent drowned out their conversation. And when I realized that something inside my fractured body was beyond my power to bring under control. Outside, the towering bulk of the Sulaco slides through a silent field of stars. Inside my hypersleep pod I lie, semi-dormant, my oxygen processors running quiet stasis cycles while I am dimly aware of the month steadily passing. Occasionally, I turn my head to check the condition of my fellow sleepers through the fog of the call membrane. Hicks lies quietly, his face half covered by bandages. Ripley and the child are in further pods, sleeping peacefully. On the last occasion I make this check, my vision is more blurred than usual. It takes a moment to realize the problem is not the membrane, but the canopy of my hypersleep pod. It is misted and beaded with moisture. Instead of a dry, deep cold, the temperature in here with me now is humid and subtropical. But before I can process this anomaly, the alarm sounds. The Sulaco has drifted. Badly. We're now in the sector of space claimed by the Union of Progressive Peoples, as sworn enemies of the commercial corporations represented by the Colonial Marine Corps. They will view this incursion as a breach of diplomatic protocol. A monitor overhead flashes into life, scrolling out its analysis of the situation. Troop Transport Sulaco, CMC 846A Beta. Mission LV 426 Return. Status Red. Treaty Violation. Cause Navigational Error. My mind, occupied momentarily with what might have caused my hypersleep pod to malfunction, now switches to risk assessment. Course for Gateway has been cancelled in favor of docking intercept with Anchor Point Cluster. Hardware protocols prevent arming of nuclear warheads in the absence of diplomatic override. Decryption Standard Charlie 9. It is inconceivable that the Sulaco will not be detected. I suspect a UPP interceptor is already on its way. And my suspicion is confirmed. The ship's computer obligingly tracks its progress. Images from the Sulaco security cameras flicker on the screen overhead. A small vessel maneuvers towards Sulaco's docking bay. How many crew are on board? Not more than three, I would think, given those cramped conditions. Through the misted canopy, I watched the monitor showing three figures as they cautiously climb into the cargo bay. UPP commandos, heavily armed. They stop to take in the evidence of Ripley's fight with the alien queen, the torn up floor plates, the acid damage in the cargo lock. The female has found a severed pelvis and legs still in a blue jumpsuit, lying on the floor. My lower half. They're headed this way, to the hypersleep chamber. And they are here. The condensation in my pod is now so heavy that they struggle to make out what it contains. My canopy rises, and something stirs inside the hypersleep pod with me. And now I realize, somehow, in the seconds before the fight with Ripley, while I was recalibrating myself. The alien queen deposited her last egg within my chest cavity. A barely viable organism that has grown to maturity inside my pod. Its occupant now makes its bid to impregnate a host. Having leapt onto the faceplate of the UPP commando leader, it is attempting to force itself inside his helmet. The creature's acid blood swiftly melts away the faceplate and it forces its way through to find the flesh beneath. The commando leader staggers out of the hypersleep chamber and away into the docking bay. 
As he does so, I observe that a weapon blast has hit Ripley's capsule. Its function line is off. The female UPP commando senses something behind her and turns around to find what is left of me, carried by her surviving crewmate. And I realize that things are only just beginning to unravel. These are the recollections of the android Bishop from the opening narration of William Gibson's Alien 3, the audio drama version. This story was also adapted into a Dark Horse comic series, each based on Gibson's screenplay, which at one point was meant to be the follow-up to James Cameron's Aliens. With this alternate story came a new version of the Xenomorph, the Hybrid, as described by Bishop in the audio drama, also referred to as the New Beast in Gibson's screenplay. It is a taller form of the creature, with beady red eyes, and a translucent dome revealing what looks very close to a human skull underneath, reminiscent of designs made for the original 1979 film. The life cycle of this new beast, including its birth, is a different take than the previous two films, with elements that may actually have inspired what we would eventually see in Prometheus and Alien Covenant. A product of the late 1980s, Gibson's screenplay has often been described as a Cold War allegory, the focus being on the concept of the xenomorph as a weapon. The idea being that somewhere inside the alien DNA, there are properties that can be extracted and used for weapons of mass destruction. The prequel films, with their inclusion of the pathogen, the black goo, also explore the same angle of the xenomorph. In Prometheus, the engineers are planning to attack Earth with the pathogen, but Prometheus Captain Yannick prevents that from happening. In Alien Covenant, we see the full potential of the pathogen's destructive capabilities, as David unloads thousands of ampules onto Planet 4, inhabited by beings related to the Engineers. This was a weapon that could literally wipe out all life on an entire planet. The ultimate biological weapon. This is how the specimen is viewed by the UPP scientists on Rodina Station, in Gibson's Alien 3, who learn more of the alien by accessing the data recorded by Bishop. They study Bishop's findings intensely, still left to speculate on the history and current potential of this organism. The readiness with which it lends itself to genetic manipulation. The speed with which its cells multiply, as though the gene structure had been designed for ease and manipulation, and this apparently universal compatibility with other plasms. It is a weapon, the fruit of some ancient experiment, a living artifact, the product of genetic engineering. A weapon. Perhaps we are looking at the end result of someone else's arms race. If not for the fact that it was written decades earlier, this dialogue could almost be seen as an intended reference to Prometheus and the engineers with their weaponized black goo. With what has now been set in place with the prequel films, Alien 3's approach in presenting specimen procurement as an arms race becomes all the more intriguing to consider how it plays into the bigger picture. But from the very first movie, a large-scale weapon always seemed to be Wayland yutanis endgame. After Ash discloses the details of Special Order 937, Ripley voices her suspicions that the company must want the alien for their bioweapons division. In Aliens, the intentions of Wayland yutani are made all the more clear through the character Carter J. Burke. The lives of the colonists and the marines mean very little to him in the pursuit of claiming this highly valuable specimen. In Gibson's Alien 3, the company is represented by the characters Wells and Fox, executives from the Bioweapons Division, who oversee the operations taking place on Anchor Point Station. While the UPP had retrieved Bishop's upper half and a xenomorph embryo and brought it to Redina Station, Wayland yutani retrieved the lower half and all the traces left behind. Samples are taken from Bishop and cloned within Anchor Point's labs. Scientists Tully and Spence undergo routine tests to determine the sample's compatibility with terrestrial, human, DNA. And they observe with shock and wonder the ability of the alien biological structure. Gibson's script describes the following. Something shivers and shakes and takes form in the cube of light, a double helix threaded with green and red beads of light. The alien genetic material looks like a cubist vision of an Art Deco staircase, its asymmetrical segments glowing day-glow green and purple. The alien form makes contact with the human DNA. The transformation is shockingly swift, but its stages can still be followed. The thing seems to pull itself into and through the coils, and for an instant the two are meshed, locked, and then the final stage. A new shape glows, a hybrid. The green and red beads have been altered beyond recognition. 
This is a visual similar to what's seen in the opening of Prometheus, showing the cellular mutation and breakdown of the lone engineer who consumed the pathogen. Though instead of a complete DNA breakdown, Alien 3 depicts the hybridization of human and alien DNA, creating something new. The hybrid. The samples at the Anchor Point Biolab develop into spores, looking like a much smaller version of the alien egg. When the stasis tubes crack open, Wells is exposed to the motes which come out of the spores. In the Gibson script, it is described as a faint, fist-sized cloud of dark mist. Very similar to the spores found on Planet 4 in Alien Covenant, which find a host and implant the makings of the Neomorph. Wells initially seems fine. She's detoxed, checked out, and appears normal. Soon enough, though, she shows signs of infection and the birth of the hybrid takes place. Gibson's script describes the event. As Wells begins to stammer, her eyes betray a terrible consternation. She rises from her chair, lurches forward, catching herself on her hands. She phases into a chattering palsy as a thick strand of blood-streaked drool descends toward the table. As the chittering tooth burr becomes a shrill shriek of inhuman rage, the transformation takes place. Segmented biomechanoid tendons squirm beneath the skin of her arms. Her hands claw at one another, tearing redundant flesh from alien talons. Then the shriek dies, she straightens up, and she rips her face apart in a single movement, the glistening claws coming away with skin, eyes, muscle, teeth, and splinters of bone, with the sound of ripping cloth. The new beast sheds its human skin in a single sinuous bloody ripple, molting on fast forward. An instant of utter silence as the featureless mask moves from side to side, scanning. In the audio drama, Bishop observes this birth, describing it as a metamorphosis, so it seems. An airborne breeding process triggering some kind of parthenogenesis. A hybrid. Wells' death and the reveal of the new beast was a standout moment in the Gibson screenplay, meant to rival the violent and shocking chestburster scene of the original film. The idea of a bloody and gruesome transformation from human to something else was revisited in Prometheus with Fifield's transformation after becoming infected with the pathogen. What's interesting about this concept as it relates to Prometheus is that in earlier designs, it looked a lot more like a human transforming into a xenomorph. It seemed less like a disfigured mutant human and more like a hybrid. One of the most unnerving traits of the new beast, according to the Gibson screenplay, is that the alien itself is infectious. A bite from the creature can begin the same, or at least a very similar process, in its victim as those exposed to the airborne moats. This particular feature has yet to be explored in any of the prequels, but it is hard to ignore all of the other similarities to Gibson's Alien 3 that can be found in both Prometheus and Alien Covenant. Clearly, there was some kind of inspiration drawn from it, though I've been hard-pressed to find any kind of acknowledgments from Ridley Scott or any of the prequel's writers and other creative forces involved that explicitly cite Gibson's Alien 3. Cited behind the scenes or not, intended or not, it's hard to deny these connections and similarities. Alien 3, the Gibson version, may not have been realized as a film, but clearly many of its ideas somehow survived mutated, hybridized, and lived on in the newer movies. Should a third prequel ever be created, do you think we'll end up seeing anything like the hybrid, closer to the Gibson script version and closer to the original Prometheus design? Comment below and share your thoughts. As always, I'd like to thank you very much for watching today. I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up, and you can also subscribe to stay up to date with all the latest from Alien Theory. My very special thanks to the Patreon Hive, Queen Albert Newell, Wayland Yutani Executives, Emurik, and Mark Fox, and in the Ellen Ripley Tier of Excellence, Lady Anne. If you'd like to join the Hive and support the channel, check out my Patreon page for exclusive posts and contests. In the meantime, you can catch up with Alien Theory over social media. Follow at Alien underscore Theory on Twitter and at Alien Theory YT on Facebook and Instagram for more. And until next time, this is Alien Theory. Signing off.